Kevin Longard, and I'd like to welcome you to the world of fly fishing. In this video, you will learn to fly fish lakes through a greater understanding of lake biology, trout food sources, trout behavior, and angling techniques. Lakes are a great big bowl of life. Certain factors will dictate what types or how much life forms will be in a lake or given area within the lake. The shallow areas of a lake, up to about 20 feet deep, will be the food factories for the lake, where photosynthesis is the most evident, the most weed growth takes place. This provides the best habitat for insects and therefore the preferred feeding area for trout. Trout will feed in deep water, particularly for chironomids and other adult insects and terrestrials but the biggest source of food for trout will be in the shoal areas. However, shallow water doesn't always provide good cover for trout, and when trout leave deep water, they need to have other secondary checks in place. For this, trout may use weed cover, natural obstructions, debris, or low light levels, but most simply feed in the shallow areas in close proximity to deep water. The more nervous the fish feels, the nearer it will stay to the drop-off. With this in mind, the drop-off becomes the prime area of a lake to catch trout, unless conditions such as hatches or rise patterns dictate otherwise. Specific factors, such as inlets or outlets of lakes, will make some shallow areas more productive than others. Trout feed on a plethora of both aquatic and terrestrial life forms. They must consume more nutrients than they expend harvesting these life forms. Otherwise, they rise to their demise. The life forms preyed upon by trout become more vulnerable at certain times. This is dictated by both life cycles and or seasonal conditions. Trout respond to this ever-changing food supply. The more abundant a particular life form is at a given time, the more the fish target that source. This resulting propensity is referred to as selectivity. Trout food sources can be broken down into two main categories, insects and non-insects. Insects can be either aquatic, those that are born and develop underwater, or terrestrial, land-borne insects that are inadvertently blown into or land on the water. In lakes, common aquatic insects include mayflies, caddisflies, chronomids, dragonflies, and damselflies. Ants and beetles are common terrestrial insects. Non-insects, those other life forms that make up a trout's diet, include forage fish, leeches, and scuds. Aquatic insects have either a three or four stage life cycle. Those with three stages, egg, nymph, and adult, include dragonflies, damselflies, and mayflies. Caddisflies and chronomids have four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. The great challenge for the fly fisher is to know and understand the times and seasons of lakes and their life forms. Lake fishing is a limited but not impossible pastime in the winter months. In areas of more moderate climates, such as the west coast of Canada and the U.S., non-insect type food sources, 
or overwintering aquatic insects may be preyed upon by trout. Many lakes, however, are under ice at this time and are waiting to burst forth into life as spring approaches. While the lake is frozen, a band of oxygenated water forms just under the ice. When the ice first comes off the lake, the wind action causes the stratified water to mix throughout the lake. When this occurs, the water tends to become murky, resulting in marginal fishing opportunities. This is often referred to as turnover. As the lake settles, the first major hatch of the year is the chronomid. Chronomids hatch virtually all season, but are strongest at this time. Fish feed on the larva, which often appear as a slim red worm, which can be found on or in the lake bottom. However, trout most commonly feed on the pupa. After the larva pupates, it migrates to the surface, becoming more vulnerable as it progresses. When the pupa reaches the surface, it hangs in the meniscus or surface film. Fish feed heavily at this time, leaving dimples on the surface. The adult then emerges upward and out of the water and falls over becoming detached from the nymphal shuck. Pupas are commonly brown, green, gray, olive, or black. Fish also feed on the adult as it rests or buzzes along the surface. During the larval and pupal stage, chronomids make very little lateral movement, but wiggle awkwardly. Therefore, your retrieve should reflect this with short strips, hand twist retrieve, or a slow rod lift. A bloodworm pattern, tied in hook sizes 10 to 16, will imitate most larval forms, and should be fished near the bottom. Pupas can be fished three different ways deep down with sinking line, moderately deep with a long leader and floating line, or near the surface with a floating line. These methods can be married, for example, by letting the imitation sink and retrieve by lifting the rod to imitate the natural's migration to the surface. Pupil imitations should reflect the worm-like body, the wing case, and the white gills that become more prominent as the pupa nears the surface. Fly should be tied in sizes 8 to 18 to cover most circumstances. The best imitation for the adult that I've found is the bodiless caddis in sizes 10 to 16, which floats well and has the sparse downwing appearance typical of the adult, which closely resembles a mosquito but doesn't have the biting mouth parts. As the season continues, mayflies next appear. Depending on elevation and climate, hatches may occur as early as April. Mayflies can have up to three or four generations a year. The mayfly nymphs in lakes are generally streamlined and quick moving. They emerge into adults that look like little sailboats on the water. Fish feed on the nymphs as they mature, but also as they emerge at the surface. Flies such as the hare's ear nymph and halfbacks in sizes 10 to 14 will generally suffice as nymphal imitations and should be retrieved with short, quick strips or a moderately fast hand twist. The adults emerge as a dun or sub-amego, later transforming into the sexually mature spinner or amego, which is recognized by its clear wing and darkened body. The spinner's mate lay their eggs and then lie spent on the water's surface. The Adams, or Tom Thumb, among other up-winged imitations, will be effective in sizes 10 to 16. Common colors of both the nymph and adult are the grays and browns. Probably the most common lake-dwelling mayfly is the salt and pepper-winged Calabatus. By late May, or early June, damselflies begin their migration. Although available to trout as a nymph during much of the year, it is at this time that they become the most vulnerable, swimming just under the surface toward shore. They crawl up onto shoreside vegetation and emerge there. 
they transform into beautiful flies, often fluorescent blue and black. Green spratlies or marabou damsels in various shades of olives are great as nymph patterns, which should be fished slow and steady with short strips or hand twist retrieves. One needn't be afraid of fishing these patterns right in against the reeds. Sometimes fish move into the shallows among the vegetation to ambush the migrating nymphs. Anglers are now beginning to use adult damsel imitations and under certain conditions work well. Nymph imitations should be fished in sizes 10 and 12, the adult in varying hook sizes with an extended body. At about the same time, dragonflies also begin their emergence, which can extend into July or even August. Dragons and damsels are of the same order and their migration and emergence similar. However, dragonfly nymphs are a more substantial food source for trout due to their large size, which can reach over two inches. Also, the life cycle of a dragonfly can be well over one year, making it available to trout year round. The nymphs range in color from brown to olive to almost black. Weed-dwelling dragonflies, such as the darners, are very large and long. Gomphus and other mud-dwelling dragonflies are stout and wide. The guinea dragon, or the dock spratly, are good darner imitations. The deer hair gomphus can be colored with a permanent marker to simulate the mud-dwellers varying color. Hook sizes for both range from 4 to 10, but the darners are tied on longer hooks. Dragonfly nymphs should be fished slow and steady with short strips or hand twist retrieves. Adult dragonflies are seldom imitated. Caddisflies probably offer more dry fly excitement to the lake fly fisher than any of the other aquatic insects and generally hatch from early June to the end of July. The insect hatches into a larva and commonly builds a case out of small twigs and or stone. At the appointed time, the larva seals off its case and pupates, later struggling out and paddling to the surface using its middle set of legs like oars. It paddles around at the surface as well until it can break through onto the surface at which time it emerges out of its shuck and becomes an adult. It must first dry its wing and may try several times to become airborne. As an adult, some sedges skitter on the surface, again using their middle set of legs. Trout feed on all stages of the caddis. Trout stomachs are often found full of twigs and pebbles from the larval case, and anglers often tie rough patterns in sizes 6 to 12 to imitate this. Retrieves are very slow as the larvas struggle slowly around with their stick and stone houses. The pupas have extensive imitative patterns available. The Canuff Lake Special, the Cary Special, and the interior sedge in lime, olives, and browns are all good patterns, fished with distinct strips up through the water column, or right at the surface. Adults are preyed upon from above, as well as below. Big deer hair patterns on the surface can lead to some amazing dry fly fishing. Often skittering these big flies along the surface to imitate the traveler sedge result in splashy, dedicated takes. Always wait for the fish's head to turn downward before setting the hook. Otherwise, you may pull the fly away from a willing fish before the attack is complete. Adult imitations 
in sizes 6 to 12 cover the average natural sizes and in green, olive, and dark brown. At certain times of the year, the lesser known water boatmen and back swimmers can be an important trout food source. Water boatmen are stout insects growing to about half an inch in length. Their movements are very jerky as their hind legs propel them like oars. They are dark on top and creamy yellow underneath, but often appear silvery as they carry an air bubble on their abdomen. This air bubble is their source of oxygen. Back swimmers are larger, more predaceous, and faster swimmers. They derive their name from the fact that they swim on their back, which is lighter in color than their almost black stomach. Like the water boatmen, back swimmers have a silver sheen as they too go to the surface to gather air, trapping it on their abdomen. These insects are not heavily fed upon by trout, but when they occur in large numbers or when other food sources are lacking, the imitations can be important to fish in sizes 10 to 14. Patterns should reflect the shimmering air bubble and the large hind legs used for swimming. Retrieves should mimic the rowing type action of the natural. These insects are shallow water dwelling and those areas should be concentrated on. At varying times of the year, terrestrial insects become an extremely important part of the trout's diet. Ants and beetles are the most commonly sought terrestrials in lakes. May and June bring the carpenter ant flights. When these large ants fall or land on the lake, fish gorge themselves. Other smaller ants are also in evidence throughout the year. The fly fisher should carry ant patterns with and without wings in sizes 8 to 16. Cinnamon, brown, and black are the prevailing colors. Beetles are also frequently found in trout stomachs throughout the season and in a myriad of colors and sizes. Foam beetles are a good all-purpose pattern in sizes 8 to 14. Other terrestrials, such as grasshoppers, crickets, and moths, often become trout food as they collide with the lake's surface. Throughout the season, non-insect food forms are regularly targeted by trout. These include scuds, leeches, and baitfish. Scuds dwell in most lakes and are often the single most important trout food source. In more acidic lakes, hyalella scuds are in evidence. In high alkaline water, both hyalellas and the larger gamorous live. Fish feed on scuds regularly, but more so in times when other food is not readily available. Scuds range in color from light green and olive to gray and dark brown. Flies such as the baggy shrimp and the Werner shrimp are good imitators of scuds in hook sizes 6 to 16. It is important to remember that a scud's body is distended when it swims, so if you are trolling or retrieving, it is more realistic to use a straight hook. Bent hooks are more appropriate when sight casting or dead drifting patterns. Hand twists and short strips are best for retrieves and moderately shallow water with good cover is typical scud habitat. Leeches are fat, worm-like creatures that slink and wiggle near the bottom of lakes. Because of their large size and availability year-round, leeches are popular with trout. Leech patterns are considered one of the best searching flies and are often trolled down deep with a fast sinking line. Retrieves should mimic the undulating movement of the leech, as should the pattern itself. Marabou leeches and woolly buggers accomplish this very well and are fished in sizes 4 to 10 effectively. Color choices include wine, olive, brown, purple, and black. Forage fish are any fish that other fish feed on as a food source. In some lakes, this is a very important part of the food chain 
particularly with large trout. Minnow patterns and streamers should be retrieved quickly and erratically in sizes 2 to 12. Trolling is often a very effective way to fish, covering huge amounts of water while keeping your fly within the trout's reach at all times. Most effective trolling is very slow, covering the shoal and drop-off areas of the lake. Action can also be imparted to the fly by either varying trolling speed, direction, or both in combination. Keep your rod tip low at all times, creating a more direct contact with the fly. Slack line makes it difficult to detect strikes and to set the hook if a strike does occur. For some of you, fly fishing may be a whole new dimension in outdoor recreation. With this in mind, let's look at some of the basic equipment and how to set it up. The rod is the single most important tool for fly fishing. Rods are designated with a weight number that corresponds to the fly line it is designed to cast. The higher the weight number, the heavier the outfit. The key is to find the rod weight that gives you casting distance, even in windy conditions, but still provides enough sensitivity to feel subtle strikes. Lighter rods provide a more enjoyable fight, even from smaller fish. For lake fishing, most fly fishers begin with a six or seven weight outfit, but often go down to a four or five as experience dictates. Eight and a half to nine feet is the standard length rod used for still waters. Reels do two basic functions. They store fly line and are used in fighting the fish. Most reels provide information recommending the appropriate matching line and rod weights. Choose a reel that is not too heavy for your rod but that has the capacity for your fly line and at least 50 yards of backing. Reels with a simple anti-backlash clicker type drag are more than adequate for lake fishing. Unreal, eh? Interchangeable spools for different fly lines are a practical alternative to buying several reels. Fly lines are designed to deliver your fly to its destination. There's an overwhelming number of options available to the angler. However, simply speaking, those fishing still waters should have a floating line and two sinking lines. Floating lines cover the top area of the lake. A slow sinking or intermediate line is excellent for shallow water and drop off areas. And a fast sinking line, type two or three, is great for fishing deep or getting the fly deeper faster. A weight forward taper is generally preferred as it allows for distance and accuracy, even in windy conditions. Double tapers, although great for presentation, have limits in the aforementioned categories. Backing is a Dacron line that precedes the fly line on the reel. It is the insurance policy if a fish runs beyond the length of your fly line. The backing attaches to the reel with an arbor knot and to the fly line with a nail knot. To demonstrate the arbor knot, I'm going to use a large piece of rope so that you'll be able to see the knots easier. I first take my backing around the arbor of the reel and make a simple overhand knot around the lead end with the tag end. creating a slip knot. To hold that in place so that it doesn't slip completely out when I tighten it up, I make a second overhand knot in the tag end of my backing so that as I pull it tight and cinch it into the arbor, 
The second knot holds it from slipping through. One of the most frustrating knots to tie is the nail knot. But what makes it much easier is a nail knot tier, which is available for various companies and utilizes a simple principle to tie the backing to the fly line and the fly line to the leader. I begin by taking my backing and pull it through the groove in the knot tire, leaving about six to eight inches. I take the tag end and I wrap it around the tire, going from the tip of it toward the back of it. I make about six turns and hold them in place with my index finger and then take the backing tag end and pull it through. I then put the fly line back through the tube in the opposite direction and secure it with my thumb. Then it's critical that as I pull here that this line comes off quickly and tightens around the fly line. So I give it a quick pull so they have a nice even knot. As I pull this tighter, it will actually cinch around the fly line and become a better knot the tighter it gets pulled. Leaders create an almost invisible link from fly line to fly. They are tapered similar to the fly line to execute the cast smoothly. The butt section of the leader attaches to the fly line with a nail knot. As the tippet section decreases due to lost or exchanged flies, tippet material can replace it and is tied on using the surgeon's knot. To more easily demonstrate the surgeon's knot, I'm going to tie it from your perspective. The leader is represented by the pink rope and the tippet is represented by the white rope. I cross the leader and the tippet over one another and then push them together to form a loop. I then take the tag end of the leader and the entire tippet twice through the loop in a simple overhand knot. After having pulled them both through, I hold on to all four ends and pull it tight. As this comes together, it makes a knot that is extremely strong and easy to tie having different diameters of leader and tippet to tie together. The tippet section is rated by diameter and pound test. Tippets of two to five pound test and diameters of four to six X are most common in lake fishing situations. The fly attaches to the leader using a clinch knot. To tie the clinch knot, I simply pass the tippet through the eye of the hook. I spin the hook to create turns in my tippet. The loop that is formed becomes a hole for me to put the tippet through. I pull the entire knot tight and it cinches on itself, tying the tippet to the hook. To get it undone, I simply pull back these turns and the tippet slides out. Always remember to moisten your knots as you're tying them tight. If they're not moistened, it can create friction and weaken your line and also make it more difficult for you to tie the knots. Now that you're more familiar with lake fishing, let's go and catch some fish.
extreme increase of angling hours on our lakes in recent years, catch and release is becoming more the norm than the exception. Here are a few suggestions for increasing the survival rate of the fish you return. A pinch down barb on your hook always makes release easier. When your fish is within reach, ideally you can grasp the heel of the hook and release the fish without handling it. Only utilize this method if the fish is very energetic. Tired fish should be gently held with wet hands, turned upside down if necessary to stop the struggling, and then cradled in the water. To revive them, move the fish back and forth, forcing the gills to flare. When the fish regains sufficient strength, let it swim away as you make a memory of another fulfilling day fly fishing lakes. Kevin <laughs> Little. <laughs> Lakes are a great big bowl of life. Certain Rick <laughs> Go back. <laughs> so what they start to say? <laughs> tends to also be a very downtime for fishermen. Their metabolism is also very slow as well. Some of them are close to dead at this time, but once the warmth of the, of the late spring come along, these will also begin to emerge into full-fledged fly fishing.
Safari West guides viewers to little known two and four wheel drive back road destinations. Preview and plan trips to secluded campsites. Dive into steaming hot springs. Or reel in the big one. Whether you hit the trails once a year or every weekend, Safari West has a variety of destinations and adventures for you. Volume 1 guides viewers to 23 lakes and other spectacular destinations between Squamish and Whistler. With many challenging four-wheel drive back roads to enjoy, Volume 2 dives into five natural hot springs just hours from Vancouver. These natural wonders make for the ultimate camping experience. Volume 3 explores over 40 great fishing lakes between Princeton and Merritt. Generally easy access makes this area truly a fisherman's paradise. Volume 4 discovers 25 superb fishing lakes off Highway 5A between Merritt and Kamloops. There are great two- and four-wheel drive destinations with the world-famous Kamloops Trout. Volumes 5 and 6 guide you through 80 awesome lakes off Highway 24 in the Caribou region. You'll be shown tons of small, secluded lakes as well as some of the larger, more famous ones. Also featured are a few special fishing resorts. Flies for BC. Tying and utilizing 12 of BC's most popular fly patterns. You'll learn how to identify insects and tie the patterns. How to four-wheel drive explains driving techniques used in snow, sand, rocks, mud, and water crossings. It's what every four-wheeler should know.